This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Britain approves another COVID-19 vaccine for public use. Tunisia extends nighttime curfew in a bid to tackle spiking coronavirus cases. And Southern Africa braces for tropical storm Chilin, set to make landfall in Mozambique. Hello and welcome. You're watching Africa Live. We're coming to you live from Nairobi. I'm Hannah Vivier. Here are more stories making headlines this hour. European Union leaders sign off on a post-Brexit trade deal. And on CDTN Pandemic Warriors series, we look at key individuals who kept things running at the height of the coronavirus lockdown. The coronavirus vaccine developed by AstraZeneca and Oxford University has been approved for use in Britain. Partial results suggest that the shots are safe and about 70% effective. The first doses will be given on Monday. The vaccine is expected to be used by many countries because of its low cost, availability and ease of use. It can be kept in refrigerators rather than the ultra-cold storage some other vaccines require. Well, for more on that story, let's speak to our correspondent, Andrew Wilson, who's live for us in Oxford. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Andrew, give us more details on these developments. Well, the news has been greeted as with a fanfare here in the UK. They're all very happy with the uh, regulator's approval of the vaccine. It was expected to go ahead, but nonetheless, uh, there's now a proud announcement coming from the government that vaccinations can begin in earnest on Monday, the advantages, as you mentioned, of this uh, vaccine are multiple. One, its cost, and two, the fact that it's easily uh, transportable. It's a more traditional vaccine uh, designed in the old style rather than the Pfizer vaccine, which is a much more modern uh, concoction. Now, with 40 million doses of Pfizer already bought and paid for by the UK government and currently being administered in a program, and now 100 million of the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine uh, being purchased by the UK government, there is now enough to inoculate uh, the entire population of the UK and given the uh, transportation ease with which this uh, latest vaccine can do the rounds uh, there's every hope that the vaccination program will be well underway uh, by the spring with large proportions of the country being inoculated against the disease uh, there are also of course concerns about how efficacious how effective this vaccine is during the trials, it came up as 65% effective, but due to a mistake in the trials, where they gave a, an irregular amount of the dosage to some of those patients, that ironically proved to be 90% effective. It's not clear whether the regulator has authorized the dose the dosage which is a 65% effective or if it's going to allow a different dosage to make the vaccine more effective. I suspect that those figures were from early trials and that they're hoping that the vaccine will prove to be more effective as the actual inoculation program goes on. Andrew, just speak to us a little bit more if you've heard any word from AstraZeneca and Oxford on that efficacy that you've just spoken about now. Thus, all, thus far, all the producers of vaccines, so Moderna, Pfizer, uh, coming out of Germany and the United States, and Oxford, AstraZeneca as well, have said that regarding the new variant, of which people are most concerned at the moment, they believe that their vaccinations will continue to work. However, there is a lot of research still to be done on this new variant. It's been around since September, but they've only really started looking at it in earnest in the last few weeks. They do understand that it's more transmissible, uh, that it passes from person to person much more easily uh, than the traditional COVID-19 uh, uh, virus, but uh, they don't yet have any evidence to suggest that the disease it delivers is any worse than the disease that's been de delivered so far. It does spread quite a long way, of course, and it has now uh, been registered as a couple of cases in Canada, one, I think, in the United States and a couple in Australia. So there's every reason to believe that this variant is far more present within the populations around the world uh, than currently recorded thus far, which goes to emphasize that there's more research needed on just how it will respond 
to any kind of vaccination program. One thing that scientists are concerned about uh, for the future, perhaps, if not on this particular variant of the virus, is that viruses do have a tendency, like the influenza virus, for example, to develop within themselves strains which are what they call on escape pathways, which get past and get through various vaccination programs. The virus, coronavirus, has the potential to do that as well, but this variant thus far hasn't shown any signs of doing that. Thank you so much for that. Andrew Wilson joining us live from Oxford. Well, China's Sinopharm has released its phase three trial results. It says its vaccine has an antibody rate of 99.5% in participants, and the efficacy rate is over 79%. Sinopharm says the results meet the vaccine standards set by the World Health Organization and China's regulators. The company says it is applied to China's drug regulator for the approval of the vaccine. Well, here's a quick recap of Sinopharm's journey to create a safe vaccine in record time. After successfully completing its phase one and two trials, it began phase three trials in the United Arab Emirates in July and in Morocco and Peru the following month. In September, the UAE issued an emergency approval for the vaccine, followed by a full go-ahead in early December. Bahrain also approved the vaccine soon after. For domestic use, earlier this year, the Chinese government gave emergency use approval for select groups. Well, earlier, we spoke to Professor Hu Naijun of the University of Chinese Academy of Sciences. He told us about Chinese vaccines and their advantages. As we all know that right now, some kind of political or economical factors are involved in the uh, distribution of vaccines. But in China, we especially facing the developing countries, we gave them fair and open access. That is the, from the political part of view. On the other hand, I think from the cost and the price point of view, as we have known that President Xi Jinping has made it very clear that the vaccines produced in China is uh, international public goods, which means the price and the cost will be not that high. So it is also affordable to the developing countries. Uh, the transportation, the storage for China's vaccine, in my opinion, is not that difficult comparing with other vaccines. And I think the most important thing is that our vaccine is the inactivated vaccine, which is much safer than other vaccines. As we all know, in US, in European, in some countries, they are using the activated vaccines, which is very dangerous, in my opinion, because the activated vaccines was used only to people who have cancers or extreme diseases. So I think this is the first time that the activated vaccines was put into people's body. But in our uh, vaccine uh, program, we have inactivated vaccines. So I think if together with the convenience of storage and the transportation, our vaccines will be uh, used more widely and more, much safer. The COVID-19 vaccine has been sparking controversy in the Muslim world. There are concerns over pork gelatin, which is a common vaccine ingredient. Pork meat is forbidden in Islam, and many Muslims believe this includes any porcine material. Egypt's Dar al Afta, the, uh, the entity that issues religious edicts, said COVID-19 vaccines were permissible according to Islamic laws. More details with CGTN's Adel Amurukhi. On top of safety concerns regarding COVID-19 vaccines, the Muslim world has an additional issue to worry about. Is the job halal? Halal means complying to Islamic law. The concern arose after reports that the vaccine contains pork gelatin. The Quran, the holy book for Muslims, forbids eating pork meat. We have two assumptions that the pork material, like fat, that changes its form and chemical structure so it becomes something else, and it's therefore halal to use, that is based on scientific and medical facts. The other option is that the fat didn't transform. It would still be allowed because there is a health necessity which makes it halal as well. In this case, though, it has to be transformed. Dar al Ifta is the religious authority in Egypt concerned with investigating whether aspects of modern life are compliant with Islamic laws. Despite a halal certification from the body, many say they will not take the COVID-19 vaccine. With all respect to the opinion of Dar al Ifta, I will stay away from the vaccine. My knowledge is poor, but I will stay away from any controversial religious matter. 
Other Egyptians are confident in Dar al-Ifta's expertise when it comes to religious controversies. If Dar al-Ifta cleared it, I will take it. I am not eating pork or digesting it. Islam orders me to listen to those who are more knowledgeable. I trust my religious institutions and I do not think they will mean any harm to us. If it's halal, I will take the vaccine to protect myself. Egypt's Dar al-Ifta is not the first religious body to allow Muslims to receive the jab. Last week, religious authorities in the UAE also said it is permissible to get a COVID-19 vaccine even if it contains pig derivatives. On Monday, the Egyptian Health Ministry has given the green light for the administration of China's Sinopharm vaccine. The government will open the registration for those interested online starting next week. Adel Mahroui, CGTN, Ras Sidr, Egypt. Tunisia has extended a nighttime curfew until mid-January, this in a bid to tackle spiking coronavirus cases there. The move comes amid growing discontent and anti-government protests in that country. Adnan Shuashi has more. Health authorities in Tunisia warned that gathering for New Year's Eve could cause a sudden surge in infections and deaths, while hospitals' intensive care units are saturated with COVID-19 patients. We will not lose anything by not celebrating New Year's Eve this week, but we could lose so much more if we do celebrate it and ignore the prevention measures. All public gatherings, concerts and celebrations are banned to save lives. For weeks, Tunisians have ignored our advice. Now the number of deaths is on the rise. At least 75 people are hospitalized every day. Restrictive measures imposed during the winter and holiday season could further complicate the situation. Analysts assert that at least 27,000 permanent jobs, as well as some 12,000 temporary and seasonal jobs, were lost in the tourism industry due to strict health protocols and travel bans. The tourism industry in Tunisia is one of the most affected sectors by the pandemic. Tourism revenues are down by 66% in 2020. Tourism growth will not exceed 33% in 2021. The losses are enormous, and the measures to contain the pandemic have devastated the tourism industry. A recent study conducted by the private sector has shown that over 72% of Tunisians reject the new measures imposed by the state because they will have social and economic consequences on millions of citizens. The situation is very difficult on all levels. I hope the new measures will really save lives, but in the meantime, many families are pushed into poverty. Who's going to help those in need? The state imposes restrictions, but ignores its social and economic consequences. According to the latest report published by the Scientific Committee at the Health Ministry, the number of recoveries reached 102,000 out of 133,000 active cases. 6,706 patients are currently hospitalized, including 332 in intensive care units and 109 on life support in public and private healthcare facilities. Prime Minister Hisham Mashishi has called for intensified control campaigns this week to ensure compliance with the law and to report violators of the decisions of the COVID-19 task force to prevent the spread of the virus. Over 10,000 policemen will be deployed for this operation. Adnan Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. The surge of COVID-19 cases in Uganda continues to take a toll on the country's health care system. Health experts warn that the new COVID-19 variant could worsen the situation. Lian Sianga reports. Nine months into the COVID-19 pandemic and cases continue rising faster than before. Patients keep arriving at the National Hospital in Kampala for treatment. But intensive care units here are already full. Almost all the patients are referred to Murago National Referral Hospital uh, from other hospitals uh, in critical conditions. You are aware about it. And some arrive to ICE from ICUs, you know, from other hospitals, ICU, of other hospitals with late stage of the disease. Uganda has so far registered over 33,000 COVID-19 cases. The capital accounts for more than half that number. Facilities are strained and authorities are worried. We really would not want to get into that scenario 
while you get into a hospital and you're not able to provide you with a bed. So we really want that people do not transition from, from mild to moderate and to severe. They should be able to get to care as early as, early as possible. Adding to fears over the surge in cases is the new variant of coronavirus already reported in South Africa and spread to Uganda would pile pressure on its healthcare systems. At the moment, our health system is performing to the extent that we still need to improve whether there is a variant or not and we will benefit from improving it. Health authorities say the country is in the process of procuring over 35 million doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. About 9 million Ugandans will be inoculated in the first phase. The vaccines will be available early next year. Until then, health experts insist wearing a face mask, social distancing and avoiding large gatherings will ease the spread of the coronavirus. Leon Sanyangasi GTN, Kampala, Uganda. Let's now take a short break and return. European Union leaders sign off on a post-Brexit trade deal. And Southern Africa braces for tropical storm Chillen, set to make landfall in Mozambique. Africa is a continent of diversity with varied climates and enchanting geography. And a people so distinct, but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Africa Live. Find your voice. I try to not let it affect me, but there are days when it does. I'm a human being, and to see patients in a hospital bed and their family members are not there. There's no one there to hold their hand that that human touch, you know? I just hope everyone can remember that the situation is not permanent and that everything will get better eventually. Welcome back. You're watching Africa Live. The European Union governments have approved a trade deal regulating relations between the 27-nation bloc in Britain, paving the way for its provisional application from January the 1st. The deal, approved Tuesday, preserves Britain's zero-tariff and zero-quota access to the EU's single market of 450 million consumers. The agreement comes four and a half years after Britain's voted to leave the bloc. The approval was a formality after the deal between London and the EU was reached last week. The measure is needed for the provisional application of the trade agreement from next year before it's ratified by the European Parliament at the end of February. The provisional trade deal was to be signed Wednesday by EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen and the President of the European Council, Charles Michel. Well, Mozambique, Zimbabwe and Botswana are bracing for tropical storm Chillen. The storm caused flooding and damaged electricity poles in the nearby island nation of Madagascar on Sunday. It reached the Mozambique Channel on Monday. Mozambique's National Institute of Meteorology predicts the storm could hit central Mozambique on Wednesday. President Felipe Nusi on Sunday said a disaster could affect 4 million Mozambicans. He urged those living in flood-prone regions to move to safer areas. 
In 2019, Cyclone Idai tore through southern Africa. The storm left a trail of destruction and resulted in over 1,000 deaths across Malawi, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe. Well, after the worst drought in decades, more than half a million urban residents in Zimbabwe are due to receive cash transfers. The funds are part of aid efforts to tackle a critical food deficit. Some families escaped hunger by practicing urban farming, which despite being prohibited, has helped bridge the gaps in food security for years. Fabrai Mokutuya tells us more. Tulani Ngube has three different pieces of land that she works in Harare's most densely populated Mbare suburb. She's been growing maize, beans, and a variety of other vegetables for five years now. I no longer spend any money on food because all of my family's nutritional requirements are met from what I grow here. It's a stress-free way for me to feed them. What she can't grow, she buys using proceeds from the sale of surplus produce from her gardens. My family can't eat all the vegetables I grow, so we sell them in the market. If I manage to grow any excess maize, I also sell that and use it to buy other things that I need. She harvested over a ton of maize last season and expects even more this time round due to the better rainfall. Her output would make some rural farmers envious, even though she's breaking the law. Urban farming, particularly in areas like this, near the banks of a stream that's just beyond this crop of maize, is illegal. However, enforcement of the laws by the authorities has been lax, which is why activity continues to thrive. Thousands of urban dwellers have invaded any available open space to grow food despite the potential environmental cost. I know farming on the stream banks causes siltation, but I do it anyway because I need to survive. This is our way of life. Zimbabwe is pinning its hopes of recovery from the current food shortages on continued good rains, which it hopes will produce enough to feed millions currently in danger of starvation. While urban farming is forbidden, it could help ensure that at least those in the cities have enough to put on their tables. Farangokutuya, CGTN. Harare, Zimbabwe. All over in East Africa, Kenya, Tanzania and Uganda are seeking to revive connected ports and maritime operations on the shared borders of Lake Victoria. Experts say the three East African neighbors could generate up to 60 billion U.S. dollars in trade annually. TDTN's Enoch Sekolia cruised through the lake to pinpoint areas that remain untapped. She is one of the larger vessels crossing Lake Victoria. The water bus is a main mode of transport for those who live on the islands. A mission transporting hundreds of people and their property daily. This thing is so nice. The reason is one, it doesn't have a lot of accidents like the road. Secondly, it is cheaper. On her normal route, she carries people from Rwanda Kotieno to Rusinga Island and back again every two to three hours. Water buses help keep the wheels of the regional economy turning. Now, according to the people we've spoken to, there are a lot of opportunities that Lake Victoria dishes out in terms of water transport that are yet to be tapped by the three African countries. These people would have put something that can walk from all the three East African countries. Even though there are many motorboats in the lake, ships are almost non-existent. And a few that can be sported are considered permanently docked. For people like 60-year-old Tom Boyer, such pictures serve as a reminder of the old good days. Until the late 80s, ships carrying cargo would arrive at the then vibrant Kisumu port. It was really, really blossoming. All that stuff from Uganda, like cows, uh, mangoes, fish from Tanzania. Produce was destined for local markets and beyond to Asia, Europe, and America. Cargo from abroad imported things all the way from Kenya into Uganda and Tanzania, headed for places like Rwanda, 
and other places. So it's not only serving the three countries, but it was serving much more than the three countries. Let's talk about the lake region countries. But for years, ships docked along the Kisumu port have been dormant. The biggest blow came when uh, Kenya Railways stopped operating and that really affected the business at the port because uh, the trains were no longer coming and instead we went into road transport and uh, actually started using Malaba route and Busia route. According to Agina, Lake Transport only realizes six billion US dollars annually for Kenya, Uganda and Tanzania, but has the potential of generating 10 times that amount. Kenya has been rehabilitating the Kisumu port to position it as a hub for inland maritime transport. All this will increase uh, business here because there will be people who are making boats, there will be people who are repairing them, there will be people who are supplying them, and there will be people who are bringing in goods and taking the goods from the port. But this dream heavily depends on corresponding infrastructure and political goodwill across the water in Uganda and Tanzania. Enoxicolia, CGTN, Kisumu, Kenya. A vote counting is underway in Niger following its general election. The current president, Mahmoudou Isofu, is stepping down after serving two terms in office. This could mark the country's first peaceful transition of power since it gained independence from France 60 years ago. An estimated 7.5 million people took part in the poll. A candidate will need to win over 50 percent of the vote to avoid a runoff. The election was able to take place despite security concerns. Niger has over the years faced growing militant attacks. Well, let's head to the Central African Republic, where elections also took place there. This came despite insecurity raising concerns prior to the polls. Armed rebels groups had promised to march to the capital, Bangui. Security forces with UN peacekeepers were able to fight off attacks to the capital. But over 14 percent of polling stations in the country were unable to operate. Election observers operated mostly in the capital due to security concerns. Final election results are expected to be announced on January the 18th. Due to the worrisome political and security climate with proven risks to the safety of its members, the mission was forced to deploy observers only in the city of Bangui and its suburbs, particularly in the locality of Bimbo. The delegation noted that on election day, Central Africans went out in large numbers to fulfill their civic duty despite a situation observed on the eve of the elections. We go to Somalia now, where a popular restaurant has reopened in Mogadishu four months after the militant group Al-Shabaab stormed the facility. CGTN's Abdulaziz Bello has more from Somali's capital. Business is booming once again at this hotel in the Somali capital, Mogadishu. The elite hotel has reopened its doors once again to city residents after a deadly terrorist attack. Militant group Al-Shabaab claimed the attack which killed and injured dozens of people. Abdullahi Mohamed Noor, a member of the federal parliament who survived the attack, owns the hotel. Noor says he will expand his business despite threats from the Al-Qaeda affiliated group. We were attacked for one reason. Al-Shabaab hates to see progress, a peaceful place where people enjoy. It prefers a dark place to thrive. It creates fear to have its way, but we say no to that. We will not accept it. We have moved on and that's how it's going to continue to be. In August, a car bomb ripped through the perimeter of the hotel. Armed attackers storming their way in, shooting and killing anyone inside the premises. Special forces from the Somali police ended an hours long siege while managing to evacuate hundreds. The biggest threat to private businesses is insecurity. If Somalia was peaceful, it would be a number one tourism destination for foreigners and expatriates. If the government solves this issue, entrepreneurs will build this country and create massive employment opportunities. 
The hotel management says it cost them thousands of dollars to rebuild it after the attack in August. Meanwhile, authorities in Mogadishu say they're working on improving security in efforts to encourage both local and foreign investment. We are seeing great business investments in the capital, some of them by foreigners. This is a result of the changing business environment and security. Mogadishu is now competing with other capitals of the world. Mohamed Amin is among the guests attending a private event hosted to mark one year in business since the hotel was established. I am a regular customer at this hotel. I have seen hundreds of graduates in the city jobless. Some have landed jobs here. If we have many similar businesses like this, our young people will be employed. That is my dream. In January 2016, Al-Shabaab killed scores at another seafront restaurant not far from Elite Hotel. Since then, a string of restaurants have cropped up around the popular Lido Beach despite an active insurgency by one of Africa's deadliest militant groups. Abdul Aziz Bilo, CGTN, Mogadishu, Somalia. Let's well, now first take a short break. Let's take a look at what's coming up when we return. On CGTN's Pandemic Warriors series, we look at key individuals who kept things running at the height of the coronavirus lockdown. Join us in global business and see Africa through our eyes. This has taken me completely out of my depth, but at the same time, it's exciting. It's new, it's different, it's a challenge. It's really exciting. <laughs> Let's now turn to our CDT and Pandemic Warrior series. Here are anchors Lindy Mtangana and Raman Yang with the la la latest installment on the key individuals who kept the society running when people remained in lockdown. Unsure and a little unsteady. The African continent threw everything it had at the coronavirus pandemic, even as it monitored and participated in efforts to find solutions. Every corner of the continent called for more medicine, more equipment, more personnel. Well, today we shine our cameras at some of the places where this help came from, the lifeblood of the battle. I'm Lindy Mtongana. And I am Raman Yang. Indeed, Lindy, the fact of the matter is, as you very well put it, this has been and continues to be a monumental battle. It's a struggle to keep systems up and running and to help those who are at home now dealing with all these new realities that we have to be dealing with on a daily basis. Absolutely a true test for governments across the continent. Now a critical part of this war on COVID-19 has been the logistical struggle, keeping both people and crucial supplies moving while also fighting to stay safe from any infection. You know, Rama, it was a forced landing for many airlines as we saw international flights being grounded as well as regional flights too. And in fact, it's hard to imagine how the pilots felt along with cabin crew and technical workers. Indeed, it's often easy to forget that it's not just about pilots and cabin crew. There's an entire chain of personnel behind them as well. And for those who are used to flying regularly, this was basically their worst case scenario being completely grounded it almost feels like a bird whose wings have been completely broken but that being said flights were grounded the lifeline around the world remained cargo flights so were spiriting supplies from manufacturing giants to the rest of the world 
Our pandemic warrior today is one of those people. Meet Gordon Onyango. He's a cargo worker at D.B. Schenker in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. He's part of a dedicated team of people that ensured, despite everything that the pandemic threw at us, cargo kept moving. D.B. Schenker, one of the leading global logistics companies supporting industries with exchange of goods through land, wildwood freight and ocean. We visit their Kenya office and here we meet Gordon Onyango, one of the loading staff starting off his day. It's rather a tough season and the protocols here are strict. Temperature checks and hygiene are mandatory. He goes through the new normal compulsory checks. Heads to the safety room for his reflector, then he heads straight to the office for a hand of a brief from the night duty teams. He gets a short briefing from the air freight operations manager and heads straight to action. Today, most of the goods on transit to several destinations across the world have short shelf life. They are perishables and time is an essential aspect. But Nyango and team have to beat time to make sure the goods get to the plane in good time. We are guided with what we call a booking sheet. In the booking sheet, we are, we are doing what we have for the, let's say we have a client who wants to his, his, his commodities to be exported to Dubai. Now we are looking at which airline we have allocated for that booking and which volumes and which time they're supposed to be leaving from Nairobi. So that's where I locate my guys. I go through the booking. I communicate with the clients and let them know if they are still on with their bookings or if there's any cancellations or if there's only volume increase or volume decrease. During this time of pandemic, we have noticed that we have been having low volumes. Uh, most of the customers have, are not getting orders from abroad. Most of the customers are not getting orders from abroad, so we have low volume of bookings. So apparently we have been running at a level whereby you can see not above par, not below par. Gordon's work ethic has always been admirable. One of the consistent workers at the company was made a supervisor. And for him, it's all about servant leadership. Even through the hard time, he has been able to discharge his duties, making sure he plays a role in the supply chain across the world. His seniors have so much positives to say about him. As a person, he is a uh a team player. He's uh, a very motivated character and he's uh, able to motivate his team as well. During this time, he has uh, he's, he's done an exemplary job because uh, even with the decline in volumes, we have had uh, also some staff working from home because of the, the COVID restrictions. But he's still been able to mobilize his teams uh, and uh, see that uh, work is done within time. We are okay, but we are hoping that things will get better because as, as of now we are into the high season. And as you can, as you can see, most of the airlines are now operating. Uh, unlike the, during the first times of the pandemic where most of the airlines had closed and their rates were so high for our clients. So we couldn't even break the margins compared to the freight charges which the airlines were giving us. The workflow is well organized. Even as other goods are taken to the air side, other goods are still coming in from suppliers across Kenya for exports and for these workers filling in the gap during this difficult season. Indeed, these are unsung heroes who have made the world a better place from former cargo, food, flowers and many other commodities the cargo workers have been able to put smiles in many people's faces across the world. They are indeed warriors armed with hope and a big heart to make the world a better place. A disturbing outcome of the coronavirus pandemic was the sharp rise in domestic and gender-based violence. It certainly called for another type of warrior, not those dealing with victims of the coronavirus, but rather victims of violence. Indeed, certainly a, a very negative outcome of this particular pandemic. This next story comes to you from South Africa. A veteran actor in that country, Patrick Shai, says it's time for men in South Africa to start seeing women and children as human beings deserving of safety and protection and to bring an end to gender-based violence altogether. Shai is a former perpetrator of violence against his partner. 
who became an activist nearly 10 years ago, when a TV drama scene that he was acting in depicted the kind of intimate partner violence he had committed for years against his wife. That was the day that the shame of his actions came crashing down, and he decided to change his ways for good. Here's the GTN's Rene Delcam with that story. It's been 10 years since actor Patrick Shy first spoke out publicly about beating up his wife, even though he'd hated seeing his stepdad abuse his mother. I beat her up for my own infidelities. I beat her up for my own insecurities. I would say, I want to beat you so hard that you scream, you cry louder than my mum. He used this public service announcement to stand up and admit to the pain he had caused. I wanted her to love me, but how can you say that someone loves you when they are afraid of you? Today, Patrick's main mission is to try and stop other men from perpetrating gender-based violence. He says he recently had to intervene in the lives of several violent, even suicidal men who claimed to have lost their self-worth as a result of the impact of COVID-19. The gravity of violence against women is so intense, it borders on hate crime. If you wake up every morning, then you hear of a woman's body lying naked in the field. She was raped, killed, body incinerated. According to police crime figures, a woman is murdered in South Africa every three hours. At least 51% of women experience violence at the hands of their intimate partners. And the COVID-19 lockdown only made things worse, says research psychologist Neziswa Titi. For most families, lockdown meant loss of jobs, right? And loss of jobs means that that um, both parties will be at home. And that means that there will be hunger in the home. And when everybody is hungry, they, they are more irritable and violence will, will then strike. And from the end of March to the end of April this year, the Children's Helpline Childline saw an increase of 400% in calls reporting the abuse of children. So that means then that children, as well as women, were in more danger at home than they were anywhere else. We live in a male-controlled and male-dominated society where men feel entitled to women and women's bodies. And that speaks to patriarchy, where women are taught and are told that they, they must be subordinate to men. What Patrick calls his Damascus moment or turning point in his life came when he had to play the role of an abusive husband in a TV show. The actress who had played his victim in the scene suddenly reminded him of his own wife when she had pleaded with him to stop beating her. And I did not like the monster that was revealed to me. And I snapped out of it and I, I cried, cut, 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 cut and I walked off set. And I was, as I was walking off set, you know, the crew was saying, what a wonderful performance. And all I could say was, it couldn't be me. Meaning this person that I saw in that vision, it was not me. I did not like that person one bit. I hated that person. That's when I realized that I needed to change. It was not about what anybody else said. It was about me. And with me, it had to stop. It should not be women who should be in the forefront of men's violence against women and children. That's men's problem. It is a men's problem. Now break the silence. Speak about your fears. Speak about your concerns. You are human. It is, it is okay for a man to be vulnerable. Uh, it, is not all, it is not necessary for you to affirm yourself physically, to want to be a patriarchal man, be a human being first.
Rena.com, CGTN, Cape Town, South Africa. Lindy, that is a pretty unfortunate burden that's been brought to bear on so many homes as lockdowns compelled couples to spend a lot more time together, but also in a very confined, limiting environment. And children too that found themselves in the same home as potential abusers. Uh, so of course putting many families uh, under pressure. And we're of course very happy to hear that in some cases there were people that were there to help. Up next, voices from across the continent. <laughs> We really need to see good things in 2021 because 2020 has been a terrible year. There was a lot of crime in our city. Our government must stump it out next year. We don't want to see it again. The status and the situation during the time of the uh, pandemic are very terrible. And they are terrible in such a manner that there is a lot of crisis in the, the economy. This is for the poor and the rich. The heat is reaching everybody. And the good thing is that we have all pulled, uh, we've all joined together in this fight to make sure that we can all be able to come out of it successful. So I'm very hopeful, I'm very, very hopeful that after maybe mid-2021, we'll start seeing some good numbers coming up. Well, as the year 2020 draws to a close, one of the key questions we're often asking ourselves is, what have we learned from this year? Well, on a lighter hearted note, I did see a meme in which somebody said, the one thing I've learned about myself in 2020 is that I have an average temperature of 36 degrees. Well, we've all been taking our temperatures this year. But that, that's the thing about this particular year. It's made us focus on a lot of things that we tend to ignore. I mean, I'm not sure if it's the same for a lot of our audience, but this is the first year in at least a decade that I can personally remember when I've not had a crazy flu bringing me down. And more from the not, it'd be like, I'd have four crazy flus every single year and we'd probably all get it in the office. It, it's a very different environment, but it brings us back to that simple focus on the essentials. It's the basic simple things that have such a huge impact. Washing your hands, you know, keeping your social distance, um, ensuring a much more stringent focus on hygiene. And if you ex expand that to the national level, we've ignored public health care for years. Absolutely. We've ignored public uh, provision of water and sewage services for years. Yeah. And yet this pandemic has reminded us those things matter. And you know what, you know, Rama, the thing is this pandemic, while it may be a first for many of us and, you know, in our history, in our lifetimes, it won't be the last. And our preparedness will come into question time and time again. We have to do as a continent, as a world, you know, proper scenario planning, proper development of public health facilities so that we are never caught off guard again. Indeed, that's certainly true. And on top of that, that does require a lot of leadership, a lot of forward thinking, a lot of forward planning as well. And that's not something we can offshore farm out and say, yeah, well, in case that happens, we'll sort it out, we'll get some help from somewhere. We've got to do that ourselves. And of course, on that question of leadership, Rama, some would suggest that there is a direct correlation between good leadership and survival rates in this pandemic. Well, on our COVID-19 survivor segment, we now bring you Cape Town teacher Tasneem van Hart, who in June suffered a serious infection of the disease. She says she fears ever contracting the COVID virus ever again and warns that we should all do whatever we can so that we never have to experience the uncertainty, the stigma and isolation that she did when she was struck down by the disease. Rinald Elkam brings us her story. Until a few months ago, grade six teacher Tasneem van Harte was a healthy 33-year-old woman living in Cape Town with her husband. Although she was educating her school kids about the new coronavirus in the classroom, she says she never expected COVID-19 to hit too close to home. When I first heard about COVID-19, uh, I didn't think much about it. I didn't think that it would affect me because I regarded myself as having a strong immune system. I hardly get sick. The last time I've had the flu was three years ago. Then in June, at the height of Cape Town's COVID-19 outbreak, she tested positive for the disease. The shortness of breath and I'm not being able to breathe at night, that was the scariest and the body ache. I came to the point of 
thinking these negative thoughts just ran through my head and I was thinking, am I going to survive the night? Am I going to wake up the next morning? She fought the virus for 14 days as her husband, Kasim Lachadin, nursed her back to health. He hardly slept because every couple of minutes during the night he would get up. We slept in different rooms. So he would get up and he would come and check up on me to see if I'm okay, to see if I'm still breathing. I survived, I got through it, I built up my immune system. I had support of my friends and family and I had many people give me advice and give me household remedies that I can use and drink. Daily I tell my school kids um, to keep their distance to wear their masks when they go out, to sanitize regularly. Even if they go shopping, to sanitize the, the, the products that they come home with. I keep telling, talking to them, I tell them this virus is real. We need to stop being naive and carry on with our lifestyles as if this virus never existed. If I think back, I'm still unsure as to how I got the virus. But one thing she does know for sure, just like doctors and nurses working on the front line of the pandemic, teachers such as herself and countless others in the classroom of 2020 are being stretched to the limit. It's been extremely exhausting, not only for us as the teachers, for the learners as well. And um, we had to adjust and we had to get used to the new normal. And our bodies are so run down that we get sick easily, there are teachers that get sick easily, we pick up germs easily because we are so stressed out. And as she marks these final 2020 exam papers, teacher Van Harter is hoping that her learners will be successful and above all, stay healthy. Renée Dalcom, CGTN, Cape Town, South Africa. Many people from right across the continent have also shared their pandemic warriors through our digital platforms, Lindy. Well, that's right. And we sifted through scores of those stories to bring you some really special ones from different corners of the continent. Take a look. For the last three days, CGT and Africa has brought you unique and compelling stories on some African warriors who exhibited heroism in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. But we also wanted to hear from our digital audience. CGT and Africa's digital media team put out a nomination video requesting digital audiences to share with us their pandemic warriors. We received lots of comments and nominations from across the continent. And from this, three well-deserved individuals were selected. To start us off, our first warrior nominee, a young doctor from Sierra Leone, Dr. Reginald Cole, who was nominated by Thomas Masakwe, who says Dr. Reginald was born and bred in Freetown and was also part of the medics involved in the fight against Ebola and is now also in the forefront in combating COVID-19. Dr. Reginald was staying at the COVID-19 treatment center at the start of the pandemic and was providing medical care for the COVID-19 patients nonstop. One of the challenges we faced in the beginning of the pandemic was misinformation. With the virus spreading fast across continents, record high death rates and cases, fear started to grip through people and misinformation spread at the speed of the virus. Our second nominee, Jama Jack from Gambia, sought to address this issue in her country. Let's take a look at what she had to do. So we developed informative posters that give detailed information on what the coronavirus is, um, what the modes of transmission are, but we also created posters that had simple guides on what people can do to prevent themselves from um, catching the virus. We employed the use of informative videos, um, producing messages on uh, prevention, producing messages on care, producing messages on the importance of social distancing and we made sure to make these materials available in the key local languages in the Gambia so we had it available in six languages including English and also included sign language interpretation. The pandemic brought yet another dark side. 
what we would call a silent pandemic, from domestic violence to teenage pregnancies. Here in Kenya, our third nominee, Joy Ogingo, a sexual and reproductive health rights advocate, provided vital information to girls living in the village of Nyakach in western Kenya. Let's take a look at what Kadin Abundo had to say about her. Joy ran a campaign dubbed Jenga Manzi na Boy Mtani to educate adolescent girls and young women on dangers and consequences of teenage pregnancies in conjunction with ending menstrual poverty. To all our digital audiences who took time to nominate their pandemic warriors and to you who made a difference in the face of a daring pandemic from CGTN Africa's digital desk, we say thank you. Well, 2020 has certainly proven to be a tough journey for Africa and indeed the rest of the world, Rama. Absolutely, Lindy. But the thing with all tough journeys, though, is that it does continue to bring out the true and the selfless warriors among us. This year, if nothing else, has been a firm demonstration of resilience and grit. Absolutely. Well, let's take a moment then to look back on some of the pandemic warriors we've spoken about, those who made a world of difference by touching the lives of others in their fearlessness right in the face of a bold pandemic. And now we honor them with a salute. Professor Steve Ahoka, Dr. Leanne Brady and the Khan community, Dumba Mohammed, Dr. Samir Girgis, and Dr. Walid Abdallah. Moses Omondi, Gordon Onyango, Patrick Shai, Tasneem Van Hart, Benson Musungu, and Sumaya Hosseini. Each of you, we thank you for your work, your sacrifice, and today we salute you and appreciate you. Indeed, the days ahead will still be fairly challenging for many of us. We'll certainly all need a lot of grit and resilience to get through them. You set a fantastic example for the rest of us to follow. Indeed, the road ahead might indeed be hard, it might be challenging, it will certainly be one that will require massive collective effort from the entire human race. The African continent itself will need to make bigger investments and even sacrifices to maintain pace with developments that try to bring this pandemic to an end, if for nothing else than just to ensure that those on the continent are not left behind. Indeed, CGT and Africa will continue to focus on those efforts and the people like you that continue to make a vital difference to the survival of humanity, which surely must prevail. I'm CGTN's Raman Yang. And I'm Lindy Mtongana. And this has been our special series, The CGTN Pandemic Warriors. Huge thank you and well done to everybody that worked on those series. Well, that's it for this edition of Africa Live. Remember that you can send your feedback to the contacts on the screen and follow us on digital media platforms. For me, Hannah Vivier and the rest of the Africa Live team, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you again next time.